Tonight, the political demands continue, but still no deal on climate. Just 10 days out from talks in Glasgow, can the Prime Minister land a policy that satisfies his party and the world? Welcome to Q&A. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm David Spears. We're coming to you live from Melbourne tonight, which is just hours away from reopening. Joining me on the panel tonight, the director of the Seed Indigenous Youth Climate Network, Amelia Telford, clean tech investor and founder of Climate 200, Simon Holmes Accord. In Canberra, Assistant Minister for Industry, Energy and Emissions Reduction, Tim Wilson. Shadow Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Chris Bowen. And in the coal mining town of Moranba in central Queensland, the Mayor of Isaac Regional Council, Anne Baker. It's great to have you all here. Now, remember, you can stream us live on iview and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Please join the debate. We can publish your comments on screen from Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And our first question tonight comes from Jason Newitt from a mining camp in Middlemount, Queensland. Do you have confidence in the Morrison government in going net zero in emissions by 2050? And what do you think that impact that will have on the Isaac region? Well, Anne Baker, let me go to you first uh, on this. Uh, you are the mayor of the Isaac Regional Council. You're a Labor Party member, but I understand you describe yourself as an equal opportunity critic of both major parties here. So the question is, um, well, do you think Australia should be committing to net zero by 2050? And, and what would it mean for the coal community that you represent? Look, what, what I think is, should there be a target? There absolutely should be a target set. And we need a target set to enable, to open up this conversation um, about forming good, balanced policy. There will be, an, there is going to be an impact, and we need to clearly understand what that is and how it's going to be delivered. And when you say there should be a, when, they, when you say there should be a target, just to be clear, do you think there should be a net zero by 2050 target? I don't believe I'm informed enough. On, I'm, I'm not a scientist about making up the methodologies of what that target should be. What I absolutely support, and I believe the majority of my region supports, the setting of a target. OK, but you don't... You're unsure as to what that target should be. Absolutely. It's not for me. I'm, I'm not a scientist okay, and, and do, I'm, I'm not going to pretend... No, fair to enough. But do you that. understand what a net zero by 2050 target might mean for the coal workers in your community? Are, are you aware of what that may mean for them? Yeah, what I, I am absolutely aware that there's a, a high level of frustration, there's a high level of confusion. What I am very confident about is that we have been at the coal face of coal mining for well over a century. We are living and breathing um, approvals around mining leases that are currently happening every week of my working life. We are living and breathing current approvals of mining projects that are being approved and conditioned for a 75-year life. So there is life in the coal mining industry into the future. What we need to be included in, from my perspective, is an inclusive conversation about a balance of energy. My region is currently running on a coexistent model. We have coal, coal projects with neighbours of solar farms. We've got coal projects with neighbours as wind farms. We've got cattle farms. So we are living and breathing a coexistent model as we speak. Well, it's good to have you as part of this conversation tonight. Let's bounce it around some of the others here. Tim Wilson, uh, let's just start with the, a, a bit of clarity on your position. Do you want the government to support net zero by 2050? Well, I do with a plan, and this has always been one of the uh, differentiators. There are a lot of political parties out there who say they want the moniker or the intent of net zero by 2050, and the Prime Minister has been very clear, and I agree with him very clearly, uh, that to give exactly the sort of confidence that we've just heard, uh, we want a plan that isn't just 
yes, it's about the environment, but it's also about the economy and jobs to steward the whole nation forward. And that's the conversation that's happening in Parliament right now, where we have people representing rural and regional communities who may, in some cases, uh, experience disproportionate impacts and uh, how we help them transition. And when we talk about the communities like the one we're talking about, uh, there are obviously investments in transition away from coal towards gas, which has a lower emissions footprint. Um, and increasingly, we want to see that as a, a destination for investment for things like hydrogen. So we're not just talking about coal being a critical part of Australia's past, a necessary part of Australia's future, but also a diminishing share of uh, Australia's future energy, but how we're actually going to add new sectors and new investment to grow the jobs in those communities so we take the whole of Australia with and us. And we'll, we'll come to some of those transition issues, but, again, I just want to clear up your position here. You've presumably seen the government's plan. You're the Assistant Minister. Do you support it and do you support net zero by 2050? Oh, resolutely with a plan I do. With uh, a plan that's, or that's, with the plan that the government has on the table? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that question. With, with, with a plan or, or do you actually support the plan? Oh, no, I support the plan. There is okay. no dispute about that. The principles which underpins it is very clearly focused on the role of technology to create uh, new investment, new jobs, so that Australia uh, responds to changing market demand, that creates an environment for jobs in new technology, technology sectors and, of course, uh, cleaner energy, while also making sure we offset the emissions of existing um, uh, things like fossil fuels and the like. Uh, and so it's about taking everyone with us as part of a national conversation. Uh, and I, that's, I think that fundamental principle is very exciting. And does this plan that you are supporting come at a cost to regions like Anne's or not? Well, it, there's an acknowledgement that there are adjustments that are made in different parts of the country where you've got traditional sectors like coal in some communities. As I said, there's changing market demand globally. It's not just being driven by what's happening domestically in Australia. Sure. And so uh, there will be a change from uh, what's demanded by the rest of the world. And in part, the plan is focused on what can we do to support those communities through that adjustment and how do we lead the investment and create the investment so that uh, it, the skills, the value and, of course, the community that exists and the identity that exists in those communities is uh, conserved but, frankly, thrives. So what's, what's the plan mean for, for Anne and for, for her community? Well, I said that before. I mean, we've seen a transition away from uh, coal towards other types of technologies, including uh, the, the role of gas. Now, the gas, gas is not the final solution, but it's a transition fuel on the way through to the use of cleaner hydrogen. Uh, and, of course, there's uh, investments in looking at things like uh, hydrogen hubs in communities exactly like this so that they can become exporters of the fuels of a net zero world so Australia can thrive and support its community. Uh, and, of course, with jobs, uh, that people are rightly proud of. Well, uh, and I'll come back... Well, let, let's get a reaction to you. The hydrogen, gas, sounds like there'll be new jobs there. Is that, is that an adequate um, level of, of comfort for you and the, and the workers you represent? Oh, look, we're, we're, we're full with frustration, to be frank. We, what, what I think needs to be really put on the table here is to be very clear about the quality of coal that is in the Bowen Basin. We, have, we are sitting on... The, the world-class metallurgical coal, world-class metallurgical coal that delivers steel. At the moment, as we sit on this panel tonight, there is there is no other answer to coal make um, to the to steel. It's metallurgical coal that is absolutely needed, world-class. The other type of coal is thermal coal, which delivers electricity. Our frustration in this conversation that we, quite frankly, have not been included in, we've got no vision over any plan, and I, I struggle to understand how the plan can be written when, the tar when a target has not been set. And when different communities and regions like the one that I lead have not been included in any of this plan in, with any of these plans or the targets. Well, no, yeah, okay. And none of us, none of us have seen the details of, of this plan that, that Tim Wilson's talking about. Yes. Uh, can, look, I, yeah. can, can I just can add to that? David, can I just make one more point? Yes. That in our, in our part of the world also, we don't use the word transition. We use the word transformation. Transitioning clearly describes you're moving away from something. And there is no replacement, as we sit here tonight, 
for metallurgical coal producing. Okay. Simon, uh, I, I can see you shaking your head uh, throughout a lot of this, so let me, let me come to you. And perhaps we need to explain to viewers what Climate 200, your group, is, is all about. You're trying to unseat uh, a number of Liberals uh, like Tim Wilson with independent candidates. Why? Yeah, well, more, more than that, we are at the beginning of a, the most amazing transformation in Australia's political system. Communities around the country that have become disengaged uh, from the political system that have been that are tired of the inaction on climate uh, on climate change. They're tired of the corruption that we see in in Canberra, and and frankly, a lot an incredible number of people in the movement are uh, frustrated with the government's inability to address the treatment and safety of women in Australia. Uh, that 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 particular issue. Communities across the country have stepped forward uh, with community campaigns inspired by uh, Helen Haynes's in, in Indi and Zali Stegel and many other strong community independents before. And they're putting a new model forward, um, MPs that are accountable, absolutely accountable to their communities. They're not uh, spending every minute of the day trying to work their way up their political ladder. They're not beholden to the party machines. They're, uh, they're not worried about their donors. They're absolutely committed to the community. And we're seeing them do fantastic stuff in Parliament. But can I just say, in this conversation about net zero, this is so frustrating. You don't get a prize for net zero, uh, announcing net zero. When Tony Abbott took, uh, signed Australia up to the Paris Agreement in 2015, he signed Australia up for a net zero target back then. New South Wales and South, uh, New South Wales and Victoria signed on to net zero in 2016. Every state and territory in Australia has a net zero target. Australia has a net zero target right now. So this this is an absolute distraction. We're talking about it because Morrison's about to go to Glasgow with nothing, nothing more than. Tony Abbott's uh, rewarmed up homework from, from 2015. Um, we, uh, we're going to be an absolute embarrassment when we, when we get there. Australia, um, that, what, what is Glasgow about? It's not about net zero. Glasgow is about the Paris Agreement, and the Paris Agreement is about keeping global warming to less than two degrees, well less than two degrees, preferably 1.5. And if we don't manage to do that, we may as well say goodbye to the reef. The, Unprecedented fire events that we've had recently will become every other year, and large parts of Australia will become both uninsurable and unlivable. So Glasgow is about the Paris Agreement, not about net zero. So if, if, if that's the case, that it's not about net zero by 2050, it's about 2030, um, why aren't you supporting candidates to run against Labor MPs? Because they don't have a 2030 target either. So we, we're not starting campaigns uh, and we're not choosing candidates. What we're doing is identifying the campaigns around the country that are strongest. And I was on a Zoom call early this year. 300 people from 72 electorates turned up to a conference that Cathy McGowan, the former min, um, member for Indi, uh, organised. And they heard about um, all the skills required and what they would need to do in order to get these, this model going. About 30 of those communities have really strong efforts and it's unsurprising that the strongest efforts are in the communities most frustrated and they're frustrated with members that don't represent them. Uh, the, the, the candidate that's been chosen by North Sydney to run against Trent Zimmerman, um, Kylie Tink, she told me, she said that she's voted Liberal every election of her life uh, but she doesn't, she doesn't recognise the party and the party doesn't recognise her. When right. Morrison said that, that climate policy uh, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be settled in the inner city wine bars and the, and, and the dinner parties in, uh, in Sydney, he was talking about her and her future constituents. So it, OK, so at the moment it's only Liberals you're trying to turf out uh, through, through this campaign, but you're not ruling out... No, absolutely not, not ruling out. When okay. strong community campaigns run, uh, well, regardless of... Uh, you know, these, these are communities that are running against the party machines. OK. Chris Bowen, let me come to you then on this. If it's not about net zero by 2050, if, if, if this Glasgow summit is all about 2030, uh, you know, the, what is Labor offering? Well, I'll answer that, David, but firstly let me deal with the question raised by our viewer and a very good question. And firstly about confidence. I have no confidence in the Morrison government. Here we are after 423 weeks in office, two weeks before Glasgow, and Tim can't tell us what the official policy of the government is in relation to net zero. After 70,000 hours in office, they need some more four-hour meetings. Uh, this is the... Global warming, climate change is the biggest challenge facing the planet and the biggest economic opportunity facing the country and the government of the country doesn't have a policy. On the regions, and the question was about how the regions are impacted, I've got good news. 
The regions will be at the heart of the transformation to net zero, and the quicker that transformation occurs, the better for the regions. The key to dealing with climate change is to electrify everything and to make that electricity renewable. And that electricity is going to be made in the regions. We're going to need much more electricity, and that's going to be made in the regions, not just because they've got the space for the big renewable installations, because they've got the skills, the skills that have powered Australia for so long in traditional energy are the same skills that will power us in our renewable economy. And we saw the BCA modelling just last week, which said Australians will be much better off with net zero, but Australians in regional Australia will be three times better off on average than Australians in the capital cities, because that's where the great transformation will occur. Now, on the medium-term targets, Simon's 100 per cent right. You shouldn't get a price for, for declaring net zero. The Labor Party's been committed to it for years. It shouldn't be a matter of bipartisan dispute. The fact that I can come on here and say it is a matter of bipartisan difference is an indictment on the government of Australia. But 2050 is not enough. What will really determine whether we can hold the world to 1.5 degrees over the next decade is what happens... Uh, sorry, 1.5 degrees warming, is what happens over the next decade. And that's why medium-term targets are so important. That's why the government should be increasing its medium-term target at Glasgow. They're saying they're not going to. It is Tony Abbott's target. Tony Abbott is a climate change denier. And it was designed okay. well, explicitly to match the United States. And the United target. States... <laughs> We the might come back, to, we'll come back to the 2030 target. Wake. We will come back to the 2030 target. But, Amelia, let me bring you in here. You heard Anne uh, talk about how coal workers, she feels, have been forgotten a lot in this mm. debate. Um, you represent young Indigenous Australians who want more action on climate change. Have they also been forgotten, do you think, in this debate? Absolutely. I think whether it's, you know, mining communities, First Nations communities, farmers, like particularly First Nations communities, though, like we are being left behind. And my heart goes out to, you know, to mining communities who've paid a really heavy price. Um, and, you know, if we could do anything, and, and the same applies to really any issue, is involving communities who are most impacted by issues in building solutions, building the plans for the way forward. Um, you know, I think for, for our mob, what's not being talked about here in in terms of, um, you know, conversations about leadership and the political football of climate change is the problem that we have with politics right now and the fact that big corporations, oil and gas corporations, are, you know, are, are holding our politicians back from taking urgent action on climate change. And, you know, you're talking about 2050. Like, 2050 is going to be too late. Last year, half the country was on fire. There's communities who are running out of water. There's places that are going to become unlivable. Like, this, it's going to be far too late, and the action that we need to see needs to be this decade. And when you talk about leadership, you know, if, if you're not prepared to step up to the game, if you don't know what leadership looks like, then honestly, get out of the way and let First Nations people, first people of this country who've been looking after this land sustainably for tens of thousands of years, step back and let us stand up. Because we know what to do in a crisis. We know what to do. It's time for you to follow our lead. Well, our next uh, question, I'd, I'd like to bring in Paul Stevenson. He's on the Sunshine Coast. Uh, Paul, you grew up in Mowra in central Queensland's Bowen Basin and your family has some close connections to the mining industry. Tell us a bit about that. I was born and grew up in um, Mowra in, in the biggest coal producing region in Australia, the Bowen Basin. My family have farmed there for four generations and many of my family members have worked in the coal mines for for uh, decades. Um, so, yeah, I have a, quite, a, quite a close connection with, with both of those industries. And I've also worked very closely with farmers all over the region who faced uh, impacts from coal mining and gas projects. So how do you feel about the idea of net zero by 2050? Um, look, I think the, the science is absolutely clear. There's, there's really no debate anymore. Um, you know, I went to the University of Queensland. We, we had some great research there showing 97 per cent of uh, uh, climate scientists agree that climate change is, uh, you know, it's a real phenomenon caused by human beings, and net zero is a, is a bare minimum response required. So what are the concerns, though, of coal miners about this? Or are there concerns? What would they actually like to see our political leaders focusing on? Yeah, look, so my, my brother works in the coal mining industry. My father worked in the industry. My uncles worked in the industry. Um, I, I think that it's possible to both work in the industry and recognise that there are global changes happening. The Japanese government, the South Korean government and the Chinese government, our three biggest trading partners in terms of coal exports, have all announced policies to achieve net zero emissions. And that's going to lead to an in inevitable decline um, in coal exports from Australia. So 
we, we have the option of either managing that in a totally disorderly fashion that leaves people socially and economically dislocated, or we can plan for that tr transition, as has happened in the Latrobe Valley in Victoria, and really make sure people are taken care of through that economic transition. So your point is this is going to happen, whatever we do. It's about managing that transition, as you say, making it or as orderly as possible. There's no denying that uh, governments and industry are moving on this issue around the world. However, Australia is being left behind because of recalcitrant pro politicians who claim to represent central Queensland. But, you know, from my experience, um, I've, uh, you know, Matt Canavan's not from central Queensland. Barnaby Joyce aren't from central Queensland. So we're, we're being left behind by people who claim to be sp speaking for coal miners, but really I don't know whose best interests they have at heart. So someone like your brother, uh, who works in the industry, what would an orderly transition ideally look like for him? Well, look, I think he's, he's been preparing for this for, for many years. He's done further training and study and he's well placed to, to uh, move into other industries. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing that needs to be delivered by government and it's government's role to manage this process. So we need, we need training, we need, uh, you know, if people want to go to university who've had a trade previously, they should have that available to them. Um, we, we need to have economic support for, for workers um, so that they're not left uh, high and dry and stranded. All right, Paul, thank you. So let's get to, I guess, beyond the sort of motherhood statements about helping these communities. What practically does it look like? Chris Bowen, let me go to you first on this. What would Labor do to help those workers practically? Well, that was a great question from Paul and he's 100% right. This change is happening and people in regional Australia understand that they're used to economic change. You know, my family came to Australia in 1880. They were coal miners from Wales. My great-great-grandfather, Daniel Bowen, came to Mount Morgan in Queensland, the world's biggest mine. Now, that mine closed years ago, and Mount Morgan's still a beautiful place, but there's not many economic opportunities there for young people. That's what happens when you don't manage change. Mm. But the key is to create the new jobs of the future. Through renewable energy, yes. Uh, through renewable energy exports, yes. And again, we saw a joint BCA-ACTU report just last week, a different one, showing that, for example, 13,000 jobs will be created in central Queensland and the beautiful Bowen Basin, what a great place it is, uh, just through clean energy exports, but also through good energy policy, which reduces the price of electricity, which means we can, we can get manufacturing going again in Australia. Uh, all the studies show us that the countries with the most complicated manufacturing sectors, which is a good thing, have good climate change policy. Australia has a, a less complicated manufacturing system. That's not a good thing. And we don't have a forward-leaning climate change policy. And renewable manufacturing, um, creating more, making more solar panels in Australia, for example. We but put but 60, are, these, are these directly David, David, transferable? We put 60, yeah, Sorry, we put 60 million panels on roofs in Australia in the last decade and 1% of them have been made in Australia, which, which is so great. much better than that. We, we absolutely can and, and I understand that the big picture pitch there, but just come back to the practical question of how directly transferable those jobs are to making solar panels, for example. Oh. Is that what's going to happen? Well, everybody's different, but it, the, as I said before, the skills of our energy workers are very transferable to new energy. You know, when I go to coal-fired power stations and coal mines and I talk directly to workers about the future, which I do a lot uh, when travel's a little easier than it is at the moment, which I've done a lot this year, I talk to people about the jobs of the future. And, and people in coal mines and coal-fired power stations want to hear about the jobs of the future. They know the world is changing. As I said before, they're used to economic change. They're used to the price of commodities going up and down. They want to know there's a plan. Now, the states are getting on with it. I give full credit to the Liberal government in New South Wales for example, with their renewable energy zones, which are four times oversubscribed for investment, which is going to create thousands of jobs in uh, the Hunter Valley, for example. That's just one example. Well, but yeah. imagine what could be done with a national framework. As Anne said, uh, and Anne has been spot on tonight, I mean, the regions have been ignored in terms of the policy development. I've met with the Bowen Basin mayors and talked to them about uh, the future of, uh, of renewable energy in, uh, in Australia. Uh, they've got a lot to offer and a lot to contribute. When we work so with Anne, the regions, let me come to the Anne. world's climate opportunity is Australia... Oh, the world's climate emergency is Australia's region's opportunity. And is that... I mean, it, it sounds great. There's all these job opportunities. Is, is, is that what you need to hear or do you need something a bit more tangible in terms of what jobs are going to be there for those working in coal industry right now? Yeah, it's about the practical impacts for, for us. What I can very confidently say is that we live change. We live and breathe change and have been for a decade. I, I'd like to put forward that I absolutely support Amelia's position in relation to our First Nations people. They have been 
their culture has been around for thousands and thousands of years. They see they should be the first group of people consulted. Myself, on behalf of our regions, our resource regions, and in the local government context, we are a level of government that is the closest to our to the community, and we're also the closest to the industry impacts. So, what I'm proposing and what we're needing is an inclusive conversation around what balanced policy can look like. We need to understand the how, and you can't. There is no way that we can get an understanding of how this policy will formulate without the setting of a target that is the enabler for an inclusive conversation with the real stakeholders to build a good, balanced, sustainable policy. As a young person, you know, I'm incredibly disappointed in the lack of leadership that we're seeing and have seen, you know, for many years now from both of the major parties. I remember talking to a young person um, in Latrobe Valley, um, you know, a, a coal mining community in Victoria, and asking them a question like, what do you see in, in your vision for the future? Do you see coal as a part of your future? And it broke my heart because they just looked at me and they said, no one's ever asked me that question before. And so you talk about young people, you talk about the role of young people you know, um, but I think the average young person or the average voter watching at home right now, I, I really actually don't think they could tell the difference between the, the two major party stance on climate change. And, you know, look, the, both major parties right now accept donations from big oil and gas corporations. How are we talking about 2050? How is there going to be any plan that we can trust when that's who you're being influenced by? Simon? Yeah. Uh, it, it's so disappointing that here we are st in 2021 still using coal communities as political footballs. Uh, it's not a game. <laughs> it's not a game anymore. But we're also... We've, we've got to move to the opportunity... to start talking about the opportunities uh, here. There, there are, there are 40,000 coal workers, coal miners in Australia. Their jobs are not threatened by Australia's net zero target. Their jobs are threatened by the net zero targets in our uh, in our customers, um, customer countries. So you, mean, you mean Japan and South Korea? That's Japan, Korea, South Korea, China, uh, and uh, Taiwan. Those they're, they're the countries that buy our coal, and all, um, all of them except Taiwan have set a net zero target, and Taiwan will do so soon. Our, the coal jobs are at their pleasure, and they've already cast the die. There. Mm. So it's incumbent upon us uh, to grab... Now, the new opportunities, we're on the cusp of the biggest uh, investment boom in regional Australia is about to start right now. Australia has such a big role to play in this energy, global energy transition. Half of the world's lithium that goes into electric vehicles comes from Australia right now. We don't process much of it. We send it overseas and have others process it. Uh, the, you know, so much of the technology, solar technology, uh, has come from Australia. Uh, we have the critical minerals, um, the, the um, uh, rare earth minerals and cobalt and nickel. We have uh, steel and, iron, um, and, and uh, aluminium, which we can process here with our amazing renewable resources. We have these boundless plains. They're windswept and they're sun-drenched. We can create... We can generate electricity cheaper than almost any country in the world. There are tens of thousands of jobs uh, waiting for us to grab... The 40,000 coal workers, we have... It, it's a group that we can help them make that transform... You know, em, embrace the transformation. They have very compatible skills with all of these new manufacturing, mining uh, and uh, renewable energy jobs that will come it's, out of this transition. Yeah, and it's about the, the, the policies, the practical... Uh, you know, the positions that are going to be there to help them retrain and reskill for those jobs. Let's get to our next question, which comes from Leslie Ann Hawthorne. Why is the Prime Minister spending endless time trying to secure consensus with the Nationals to take action on climate change? Am I correct in believing he has the power in Cabinet to actually lead and immediately declare the policy the great majority of Australians and the business lobby now want? So, the news this evening is that the National Party Room has held a further uh, meeting uh, tonight. Uh, and they have now finalised a list of demands and uh, given formal approval to Barnaby Joyce to negotiate with the Prime Minister on this. Uh, they want more funding for regional Australia as part of the deal. Uh, the two leaders will negotiate over the coming days and the Nats will meet again on Sunday afternoon in Canberra. Tim Wilson, um, as the Assistant Minister, are you aware of what these demands are from the Nats at this stage or not? 
Well, firstly, David, it was disappointing I wasn't given the opportunity to contribute to the answer or the question that was asked before, um, because that's precisely why we're investing $20 billion through different grants and finance mechanisms to invest in regional communities, so that uh, regional communities don't, don't uh, uh, just have jobs but the opportunities and thrive, exactly as people have outlined. I mean, Simon was correct about critical minerals, and that's why there's a critical minerals strategy about how Australia can take advantage of the incredible rare earths and critical minerals that are available to Australia. We went through them, lithium, cobalt, uh, nickel and the like, and how they can be critical inputs in things like renewable energy, battery technology and, of course, other types of technology necessary for national security. Uh, so this is already the conversation we're having. And uh, we've heard tonight how communities feel disempowered. And I think that's fair enough. I think there are plenty of people who want to have a voice in this conversation, because it's not just about uh, one section of the community. It's actually about how we move as a nation forward together. And that includes rural and regional communities. Okay, so it includes people the, in the city. Yeah. I'm answering the question. Yeah, rural um, and regional the, the, communities the as question. well as the cities. And one of the critical things is we have members of parliament, whether people agree with whom they're elected from, which communities or not, are participants in that conversation. And they're actually bringing them forward forward to the Prime Minister, as other members mm -hmm. of Parliament do, to say, this is how we see our future yeah. through the leadership of net zero for the future of the country. And um, that's a fundamentally good thing. Now, the details have only been released while I've been on this program, so uh, I haven't <laughs> seen them. I haven't no. seen them, uh, for but, one. But, Tim, you have, uh, but, Tim, but you have no intention... You have no intention to comply or to, to uh, embrace the Paris Agreement, right? The net that, zero target... Pause, actually. Net, the net well, zero well, target will not keep Australia well below 2 degrees or well, down to 1.5. So, 1. so 5. that's just false, Simon. For, let, let's just start from a basic point. An entry condition of the pa uh, Paris Agreement is to have a 2030 target. The Liberal National Government has a 2030 target. With all due respect to him, Chris Bowen does not, and the Labor Party does yeah. not. But we have every intention the, the of honouring on you and that's why we're going through this process of just introducing mechanisms, the, the including what we need to invest in technology uh, and to empower communities, particularly regional communities, to be part of the solution. But you know, as I know, Simon, that the challenge of climate change can't be solved by Australia in isolation. Where a little over one percent of the world's emissions, yeah, we need well, the rest away of the from world. The Part Wilson, of that conversation the, the, too. The, the point is, right now, the government does not have a 2050 net zero commitment, right? Because this is still held up by the Nationals. And this is what the questioner, Leslie Ann, is asking about. Should Cabinet just make a decision and get on with it? It's only 10 days to go until Glasgow. Or should you wait until the Nats are on board? I think we should have a democratic process that involves cooperation from members of parliament and communities across the country so we don't have disempowered communities and disempowered voices. Does that mean, uh, does that mean only take forward the policy if the nationals are on board? Well, I'm not going to speculate on hypotheticals. I mean, I'm interested to see what the details are um, and what the requests are. But if well, it's, it's, not, it's designed really, to, no, it's designed I take your to point. advance You don't know, you don't know what they're the asking for. But I'm just asking you the principle of whether you should... Go ahead without the Nats. Go ahead regardless. Make this commitment in Glasgow. Why would I concede the scenario where we went ahead without taking the whole of the country with us? The principles of... Uh, I'm not talking about the whole inclusion country. Inclusion I'm talking about the Nats, because this has been dragging on all week. And you can't honestly say you're relaxed about how long this is taking, surely. If it involves a, transi a transformation which actually leads to more jobs, cutting greenhouse gas emissions and Australia being a resp responsible actor, uh, I'd have no problem in making sure we work through those to get an outcome. But Australia is not a responsible actor in this, right? We, are, we, we will be one of the only countries, one of the, our only allies that are going to this conference without an increased ambition for 2030. We've done, you've done nothing in your government the last three terms. You're doing nothing this term. Well, you've Simon, breached your false. promises to the, to the public on reducing, reducing emissions or uh, emissions policy. Simon, and false. you've got emissions... no plan for the next three terms of government. 2050 is 12 terms of government from now, uh, maybe even more. What is the government going to do to increase our ambition and deliver on a Paris agreement uh, uh, you know, to, keep the globe, to keep the temperature of the planet below two degrees of well, warming? Look, we are going well, to come so to this no, 2030 sorry, debate. A, We're going to come to this 2030. There's a series of accusations that have been made there, which just is quickly, false. Tim, just quickly. Emissions are down by 20% off 2005 level. Uh, that's, Tim, that's, that's, that's absolute, absolute that. nonsense. That's Look, somewhere between a, a trick like and a lie. China, Can I talk about the 2030? Between 65% since 2005 levels. This is the way the international standards are set. 
They are down by 20 per cent since 2005. And one of the reasons why people are now calling for increased ambition is because every model and every trajectory shows that we're not just going to meet it, but we're going to beat it. OK. Now, now, for years, Simon, people have been okay, saying Tim, that isn't Simon, the case, and now Tim, people I've are coming to realise... I've got to take you and your down. government to the, task about this 20 per cent Now, just address that, if you can. You said that's you false. Chris Bowen let's, about I've 20 got to, I've, Simon I, I have question. to take you to task on this 20 per cent reduction by, by 2005. I see the advertisements, taxpayer dollars everywhere, telling Australians, great, you've done a great job reducing emissions by 20 per cent. OK, let's put the land sector aside for a second. In the the economy that we have to transform, you've reduced emissions by only 3% over the last 15 years. Yes, the land sector has been uh, uh, an area where we have made some progress. We stopped land clearing, not because the government made it happen, because the Queensland government shut down land clearing. Now, we are hiding behind that fig leaf. You can't stop land clearing again. You've made no inroads on transforming the rest of the economy and you have no plan going through from here. We've got <laughs> to move away from these tricks and lies. Australia is not doing its, uh, pulling its weight on climate change. Simon, the tricks and lies are to say that the, pre the provisions that are in the Paris Agreement and how we actually account for emissions don't count because it doesn't suit your narrative. No and other country does this, Tim. No it, other it, country it, uses no, that's the land not sector. True. The okay. land can we just agree that the bulk, the the bulk of that 20 per cent of their emissions? Can costs. we just agree and move on that the bulk of that 20 per cent is thanks to the land clearing uh, and that there's disagreement as to whether or not we should be including that or not? Amelia, let me ask you. Yeah, this Back is to the question. The question so was about leaving the Nats to one side and just the Prime Minister and Cabinet making this commitment and going ahead with it. Is it important to bring those Nats along or is it time now to just say enough? The time is to say enough. Like, you know, we need to bring this back to what this is all about. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about the crisis that we are facing right here, right now. 2050 is too late. You know, if you want to talk about 1.5 degrees, I think about my Pacific Islander family who have been saying ever since Paris, before Paris, 1.5 to stay alive. You know, my friend, the late Coretti Tiamalu, um, she's passed away now, but um, she was the leader, of, uh, founder of the Pacific Climate Warriors. And she used to say that the future of the Pacific Islands and the future of the fossil fuel industry cannot coexist. And it's the fossil fuel industry that needs to back down. And this is so frustrating. Like, this is absolutely a distraction from the action that we need to take. And I think that, you know, as a young person, you wonder why young people are frustrated right now and hitting the streets. You wonder why our mob have, you know, felt like we haven't been listened to for so long. Australia has the potential to be a global leader on this. We are one of the sunniest countries in the world. We're one of the windiest countries in the world. We're home to the oldest surviving Aboriginal culture, Indigenous culture in the world. Like, we have what it takes. I said it before, but I'll say it again. Like, if you don't have what it takes to be a leader in this country, then step back and let us step up and lead. Yeah. All right, well, let's, let's yeah. get to this 2030 argument that we're hearing a lot about tonight with our next question, which comes from Australian singer-songwriter Holly Rankin, who performs as Jack River. Labor have been extremely vocal about the Morrison government's lack of an ambitious climate target heading into COP26. Yet the opposition themselves haven't put forward an ambitious climate target. The public and the international governments are wanting something that looks a little more like net zero by 2030. Why are Labor asking the Morrison government to take this action when they themselves haven't put forward an ambitious policy or target? The youth are really wanting a party that takes climate action, but we are unable to see it in either major party. If Labor want to take climate leadership, they need to put forward a, an ambitious climate target. So, Chris Bowen, why doesn't Labor have a 2030 target? Well, thanks for the question, Holly. And let me say, uh, we have tried to give the government an opportunity to get this right. We've been calling for net zero for 2050 for years, and I agree with everything everybody else has said. It's not enough if that's all you do. You need to get there quickly. Hence, the medium-term targets are very important. Hence, we've called specifically for the government to increase the medium-term target they take to Glasgow. Now, unfortunately, I'm not representing Australia at Glasgow. I'd love to be. I'm not. We're actually trying to, in the national interest, give the government a chance to see if they could come up with something that we could give bipartisan support to. Uh, they're not going to, it's pretty clear now, but we've still got two weeks for them to get to Glasgow and lift the medium-term target. 26 but, sorry, 28 why, why is does, does Labor well, not having a target put pressure on the government? Surely, I, I understand the politics, it might not, not suit you, but um, to get a better outcome at Glasgow from your perspective, wouldn't it be better to say, here's what we think 2030 target should be? 
Well, we think it should be better than 26 to 28 because 26 to 28 is not enough to hold the world to 1.5 degrees. It is not, I agree with Simon, it is not in keeping with our Paris commitments. What is? We need to do better. And so what is important is if at the time of the next election the government has lifted its game, the Australian people have a very clear choice and they'll have that choice. Not only will we be outlining our medium-term targets, we'll be outlining how we'll achieve them. Scott yeah. Morrison says you can't have targets without policies. I actually agree with him about that, but he uses an alibi not to have either. And we'll be having both. And Chris Bowen just said there, 26 to 28 per cent is not enough. Labor clearly will go beyond that before the election. What do you think? Do we need something more ambitious for 2030? Oh, look, what I think is we need to remove the politics from this conversation. Yeah. And it should not be about any one political policy. Um, okay. well, leave party. the politics to one side. Do you think Labor should have, should, should Australia have a more ambitious 2030 target? What I believe is we need a target. More ambitious than the we current need, one? There needs to be a target. We have, at the moment, we're talking, we're sitting here talking about a target that the conversation's been going on for over a decade and we're still talking about setting a target. No, no, Does no. I'm talking about the 2030... Target. The 2030 target is 26 to 28 per cent. That was set by Tony Abbott. That is still the government's target. Is it enough? No. Look, I, I, I don't believe... I'm not a scientist. I said that at the beginning of the, of the program. I, I'm not sure what the target should be. What I know is we need to get on with the business, remove the politics, set a target so we can collectively have an inclusive conversation about setting a balanced balance of energy and a balanced plan. So should Labor, should, would you like to see Labor's numbers on this? Should Labor set a target? Both sides of government, both sides of politics should be setting okay. setting a target and having the, a position on this. So let's, let's just remember, um, you know, people put themselves into the political arena and that takes a lot of courage. We, we look to them to set policy. What, where I sit is we are, we are a community that's coexisting with the closest level of government to the people, with the closest level of government to, to the industry impacts. We bring a lot of value to this conversation. We need to be able to provide that feedback, that information to our elected politicians regardless of what party they're attached to, okay. to inform a stable, balanced policy. So on this... Can we just get the targets set and get on with well, business? Well, OK, that's, that's what we're trying to... Try... Can be removed. That's what we're trying to establish here with the, the, the two sides of politics. So just on 2030, the US is now committed to 50% emissions reduction by 2030. The UK, 68%. Japan, 46 South Korea, 40 The EU, 55 a number of states in Australia are already at 50% target by 2030. Tim Wilson, why is the government sticking with Tony Abbott's much lower target? Well, at least we have one, unlike Labor Party. Okay, um, but, uh, one of the reasons we're sticking with it is because it's the one we took to the Australian people at the last election and they voted for. Now, the yeah, but hang on, just on that, because I've heard oh. the Prime Minister use that line all week. Yeah. Um, you, 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 you went to the election without any sort of 2050 target and you're uh, uh, you know, now suggesting you do want to make that. You didn't say anything at the last election about you know, cancelling a big submarine contract with the French or oh. closing international borders because of a pandemic. The point is, things change. Global events require governments to adapt and, and, and reposition. Are you, are you seriously saying you need to stick with the 2030 target that, that Tony Abbott set? Well, it was actually one of the critical battlegrounds in the last election about what the target was. Labor said they wanted 45 per cent. They were defeated. We said 26, 28 per cent, and we were successful. And what we've said, uh, and I agree with, but is that Tim, to, it was based, to, to, it was based to on a bunch of lies. Can we just, can we just talk about sure we achieve the answer, then we'll a, get to a basis where we take the Australian community with, where we don't disempower communities and they get to be a participant in the conversation, which everybody says they support until it isn't them. I'm saying I do want to include the entire Australian community is that if there is any uh, change in ambition that we would take it to a future election. And, you know, there are good signs. As, uh, as well, why don't you take it to the next what election? What we've seen is a trajectory <laughs> where we have an... In we're ex uh, likely to exceed our emissions targets by 26 28% by 2030. That's why everybody's saying, can we increase the ambition? Now, some people want to dismiss uh, what's been achieved. There's a lot more work to be done. So you could and take to the to next election sure that we're a higher full participation and we have the Australian community in OK, on those grounds, you could take a higher 2030 target to the next election. 
Well, that, that's we're looking at what obviously the projections are for emissions cuts, and that will be a conversation for the next election. So you are looking at taking a higher 2030 target to the next election. Well, uh, as I said, well, ours will be based on data and evidence, and uh, and making sure we get consent of the Australian people. But is this is not, it's not a unilateral decision for me. Unlike um, well, you're the assistant Bowen, minister who could now. announce his 2030 you target. Okay, you, I'm not actually the minister. You have some authority more than anybody on this panel tonight. You are the assistant minister. Can you mm -hmm. confirm you are considering taking a higher 2030 target to the next election? What I can confirm is that if we do something like that, it would go through proper processes through the party. It wouldn't unilaterally be done on this program. Simon. This, this is such deja vu, right? This, this far before the last federal election, rings were being run around the coalition for not having a, having a carbon policy. You stepped up and, and announced uh, February 2019, it was at the, the Climate Solutions Package, a $3.4 billion package. Well, it turns out $1.4 billion of it was uh, Malcolm Turnbull's Snowy 2.0, a 2017 scheme. Two billion dollars was the new carbon. What was it? Carbon uh, Solutions Fund, uh, which was to pay uh, for the government to spend our tax dollars to pay to offset the pollution of companies that wouldn't invest in the technology. How much of that two billion has been spent? Absolutely zero. Right. And then the last part of that carbon solutions package was an electric vehicles uh, strategy that uh, Angus Taylor was supposed to announce. He sat on the electric vehicle strategy for two years and eventually announced uh, it co was called the Future Fuel Strategy, FFS. Uh, and FFS, the Future Fuel Strategy, recommended that we don't buy EVs. It's no wonder that people are feeling disappointed, disempowered when they're constantly gaslit by this government. OK, um, look, Amelia, just quickly, 2030, the question was about 2030 and why Labor doesn't have a target, and, and we know the government's target is still where it was under Tony Abbott. I listed where some other countries are at. Where do you think Australia should be? Australia should be a global leader. Like, we're, we're holding us... We're, well, you guys are holding us back. Like, this is so frustrating. I think, you know, you, you talk about being... Um being in front in terms of emissions. That's an absolute lie. It's an absolute joke. Like, you say that whilst in the same breath you are also... You, and you know full well that this government is funnelling hundreds of millions of dollars to an industry like fracking in the Northern Territory that scientists have told us, communities have told us, will absolutely blow our ability to limit global warming to less than 1.5 degrees if just one of those basins alone were fracked. And, you know, these are, these are Aboriginal communities who are fighting like hell to protect their land and water and have been for over a decade, and, and yet you continue to ignore them. So how are these projects getting up? They don't stack up economically. You know, Empire Energy have just been given $21 million, um, Origin Energy, Santos, all these companies, you know, and yet you... And, and you know, Labor, I'm sorry, but the, the, you had an opportunity to be able to stop this, and you didn't. And so, you know, I think that... Really, it's just incredibly disappointing. Well, did, and you know better. These are lies. Let me get a quick response, Chris Bowen, on gas, because it's an interesting point. Um, would, would Labor continue expanding uh, the, the reliance on gas, the ex exploration and extraction of gas? Well, gas is a big topic. We won't have time to do with it all tonight. Well, just gas give us a quick answer yeah, on I'll, that. I'll, you, I'll can, you can at least tell us whether you want to expand it. I'm trying to, David. Um, uh, gas is going to play a role in the system for some time to come because we're going to need to build the storage to cope with 100% renewables. I'm very passionate about getting to 100% renewables, but we are nowhere near having the storage necessary for uh, the times uh, that we not only need at, at night, but for a long so period of, of lower wind. Ga we're going to need peaking and firming. There's three choices. Nuclear, I'm against. Coal uh, is not going to... There's going to be no new coal-fired power stations in Australia, certainly not under a Labor government. And then gas is the only third option to have peaking and firming while we're building the storage, the, the batteries, household, community and grid, the pumped hydro, the hydrogen, all of which I'm passionate about, but are going to take us years to get okay. to the level we're going so to... What about when years. Aboriginal okay. communities are saying no? Well, uh, Aboriginal communities in the Beedaloo Basin, for example, covers thousands of square kilometres with thousands of traditional owners. The Northern Land Council has been handling the consultations. They tell me that there's very nuanced views amongst those thousands of traditional owners, as you would expect. None of us... I'm not a traditional owner. I respect the role of the Northern Land Council uh, with the negotiations and discussions that they've All been right. having. We've got to move on. Our next question comes from Riley Martin. Hi. My question is for Chris Bowen and Tim Wilson. Given that in 2007 was agreed upon by both major political parties that an emissions trading scheme was the best way to reduce emissions at the lowest economical cost. 
Why, in 2021, are we not considering an ETS, despite major backing from economists as well as scientists? Is this just a case of politics getting in the way of good economics? All right, well, just get a quick one from Chris Bowen and Tim Wilson on this. A price on carbon, some sort of emissions trading scheme. Why aren't we doing that, Chris Bowen? Well, thanks for the question, Riley. I was a member of the Cabinet that agreed on the carbon price, uh, which was repealed by the Liberals. But the world has moved on. Renewables are now the cheapest form of energy. Uh, and now the best way to reduce emissions in Australia is a sector-by-sector -sector approach. Transport, electric vehicles, uh, electricity making it renewable, working with farmers on agriculture. If you carefully design your policies, sector-by-sector, -sector, uh, so you can craft your policies to get emissions down, that is now the right solution uh, for Australia. OK, you say the world's moved on, but there's a long list of countries that are doing a price on carbon. Estonia, Japan... Japan, Chile, the UK, France, Canada, New Zealand, Germany, South Korea, Mexico, Finland, Sweden, South Africa, <laughs> Ukraine. China's just introduced a nationwide uh, ETS. Tim Wilson, you're a believer in markets. I am. Why not? But, that does, but, but an ETS is a form of regulation using markets to distribute it. You know, Malcolm Turnbull actually got this right when he said ETS or carbon pricing is better in theory than practice. So all these and countries have got it on... wrong. All these countries have got it wrong. No, no, no. There are different countries that have their unique conditions and they can do it their way. We'll do it the Australian way. But the reality is to have a, a, an emissions trading scheme that reflects the Australian conditions, you need a carbon tax in the vicinity of hundreds of dollars per tonne of CO2 equivalent. Uh, and the Australian people have rejected that, let alone the one that, of course, the Labor Party introduced. All right. The Business Council still, funnily enough, yeah. believes a price on carbon would be the way to go, all, Simon. All, all, all the economists agree that a price on carbon is the cheapest way to do it, but it seems like it's not politically in not politically possible in Australia. And you can forgive Labor for having PTSD over, over this issue. But back to being gas, gas lit. Back to being gaslit, Angus Taylor, our emissions reduction minister, has spent the last 20 years fighting renewable energy and we put him in charge of emissions reduction. And, Tim, you spent the better part of the last decade fighting against carbon policy as the director of uh, carbon policy at the, at the Denial Institute, in, Institute of Public Affairs, right? You argued against the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. You argued uh, to abolish the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. You no, argued didn't. that Australia That's should false. pull out, should pull out of Kyoto. You've got because Kyoto didn't include the United States and China, decarbonisation whereas the Paris Australia. Agreement does. And that's the fundamental difference. We have to work with the global community to cut greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the big follies of the Kyoto Protocol was New Zealand was out, the United States was out, and China was out, yeah. as so well as many the other countries. Thing and so what you actually had was a deal which actually would have done nothing to cut global greenhouse gas emissions. Right, yeah. Paris achieved that. That's right. why we're right. I don't want right, to get bogged down on what happened back in Kyoto. But anyway, let's go to... Well, we'll make this our final question tonight and it comes from Dash Hunter Clear. Hi there, my name's Dash and I'm 14 years old so I'm a bit younger than most of the viewers but I'm really enjoying Q&A because I get to hear so many different views on important topics. My question tonight is, well, I live in a big-ish family and me and my sisters are very family oriented. We talk a lot about how global warming will affect our future kids and grandkids to come. So I was wondering what the panel's thoughts were on how global warming will affect future generations' childhoods and how detrimental it will be for their day-to-day -day life. Also, should I even think about having kids, considering how bleak the future looks? Amelia, I'll let you go first on this one. What would you say to Dash? Yeah, Dash, look, you know, it is and it can feel really doom and gloom right now. You know, uh, the reality is, is that we're already facing the impacts of climate change. We have been some, for some time and unless we see ambitious action in the next decade, we're going to continue to. You know, for, for communities that I work with, you know, in the Torres Strait Islands, um, communities are seeing their burial grounds being washed away into the ocean, seeing the bones of their ancestors. Um, you know, we all experience the fires. We're seeing remote communities um, you know, who, who are going without water. Like, the impacts are here and now. And, you know, I think in terms of, um, you know, thinking about your future, I would say, you know, get involved in, in movements, stand up, like, be the leaders that, that, you know, don't wait for anyone else. Like, the time is now. Be, be the leaders that, are, that, you know, can stand up and give our politicians no choice but to follow. Yeah, look, and uh, Dash is obviously concerned about the climate impacts. What do you hear from young people in the council area you represent? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Dash. Uh, look, the, it's critical for us. Our young people are just, just as invested as any youth across the country in terms of the environment and what what's their future. I think from my perspective, we need to make sure that our youth are informed and educated, that they have a full understanding 
of what this all means. And that can only come from inclusive conversation, education, and we just haven't had that experience. Chris Bowen. Uh, good on you, Dash, and my message is there's a bright and optimistic future with Australia as a renewable economy, a renewable country, and exporting renewable energy to Southeast Asia, and young people are going to be big beneficiaries of the jobs created and big beneficiaries of getting this right. You know, last night in Parliament, I read a speech to Parliament written by 16-year-old Jaden Union in my electorate, who was passionate about the opportunities for Australia. We can do this, and you're going to be a very important part of it. Please don't let the toxic debate in Australia get you down. We've got a bright, optimistic future as a country, we can be a leader and we will be a leader with a government that's as good as the people are. Tim Wilson, I mean, you know, there, there are studies showing anxiety amongst young people when it comes to this issue of climate change, you know, serious worry. What would you say to Dash and, and to other young viewers who are very uh, upset and concerned about what the future holds? Well, we take those concerns very seriously, but to be truthful, I'm not dissimilar to Chris Bowen in the sense that I'm completely optimistic. One of the solutions that's always been present with climate change is the power of technology, both in terms of cost and what it can deliver. And so I think we're going to smash this challenge. I think we're going to meet it very comfortably through the power of technology. Now, some people want taxes and other measures, um, but I think we can be optimistic about what we can achieve. And to the, to the question that was asked before about should you have, you know, children, of course the answer, yes, you should have children, uh, because uh, I I want them to be able to share into the future and the opportunity of what Australia can achieve. Today, I introduced my first piece of legislation, which was to enable uh, offshore wind farms and other electricity uh, infrastructure around Australia's coastline. We're going to meet this challenge very comfortably, uh, and I'm very excited about where it can be and the opportunity we can present for future generations. Simon, I'll let you go uh, finally uh, on this. Your message to young people worried about where Dash, climate change is going to leave them. Yeah, th thank you, Dash, for that question. What, what gives me hope right now is this community independence movement. If we could just get two or three more pro-climate, pro-integrity candidates uh, onto the crossbench at the, next, at the next federal election, we wake up the morning after and we wake up to a very different country. We wake up to a country that can move past so much of what we heard tonight were debates that you could have tuned in uh, to current affairs programs 15 years ago. We get to move past that as independents of the calibre of Zali Stegall, Helen Haynes, Rebecca Sharkey, Karen Phelps before, uh, before then, get to uh, approach these issues. Now, Climate 200 is supporting those. We have three, three and a half thousand members so far. One of them told me recently that this community independence movement is active hope. So rather than sitting at home complaining about what Morrison's not doing or what Labor's target's not high enough or whatever, uh, rather than sitting and complaining about them or the Murdoch media, get involved with local community uh, independence movement. And if there's not one locally, uh, see if you can volunteer for one or help us at Climate 200. Three and a half members so far, two and a half million dollars in our war chest, and we're going to make a big difference in the next it, election. It, it, it's, it's a, it sounds like quite a pitch uh, that you're making there for, for the organisation. Join us. <laughs> but beyond, um, look, beyond an immediate, I, I suppose, political campaign to, to get independence into the House, Beyond that, when we talk about, you know, what sort of policy is actually required uh, from those who are elected, um, what, what needs to happen to give comfort to, to young people? Well, t take a look at, at what these independents are trying to do. You know, Zali Stegall uh, just, just today put up a bill in Parliament to try to stop offshore uh, drilling, drilling of oil and gas off Sydney's beach, beaches. Unfortunately, Tim's side of government blocked it. If he was in the House today, he would have voted against it. Uh, what gives us hope is... Think about these independents. Now imagine just two or three more. They'll have the balance okay. of power. I think we and get they the will, And they will deliver <laughs> solutions to the problems that Parliament is blocked on right now. All right. Look, thank you all very much uh, for a, a lively discussion tonight, but a very timely one as well, given all that's been going on this week. That is all we have time for. Please thank our panel, Amelia Telford, Simon Holmes Court, Tim Wilson, Chris Bowen and Anne Baker. And thank you all for your questions tonight. Next week, Stan Grant will be with you live from Sydney for a somewhat theatrical Q&A, Lessons on Life and Leadership, with theatre director John Bell, writer and actor Nakia Louis, satirist Paul McDermott, author Bree Lee and philosopher Tim Dean. And I'll see you on Sunday morning on Insiders. Stay safe. Good night.